If it's Wednesday, Division 2024, brand new NBC polling reveals just how deeply divided voters are on cultural issues that are tied to race, values, and transgender rights. As Republicans look to capitalize on the culture wars in the race for the White House. Plus, the House plans to vote very soon on Speaker McCarthy's messaging bill on raising the debt limit as he tries to keep his caucus in line and pressure the White House to come to the negotiating table amid a threat of actual economic calamity. And another Republican officially throws his hat in the ring to challenge former President Trump for the Republican nomination as President Biden addresses concerns over his age for the first time since officially launching his reelect. Happy Wednesday and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I am Chuck Todd reporting here in Washington and I've got some brand new poll numbers from our latest NBC News poll on a set of issues that are roiling our politics and could be riling up voters, particularly in the Republican primary for president. Our new poll shows that on issues that are tied to race, culture and personal identity, our two parties are just extraordinarily far apart. They're so far apart that it's having a profound impact on our politics. These numbers are hot off the presses, as we used to say, when presses meant something. Let's begin with a fundamental question about how voters view our society. Is America racist? 85 of Democrats, 85% of Democrats say, yes, it is. 65% of Republicans say, no, it isn't. On race and racism, there is a deep disagreement between the parties as to whether we have achieved Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of a nation where children would be judged by the, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. 70% of Republicans say MLK's dream is a reality. Democrats com uh, completely disagree. On the question of what is more important, a greater respect for traditional values or encouraging greater tolerance of people with different lifestyles and backgrounds. 67% of Democrats said tolerance was more important, while 74% of Republicans said traditional values were more important. And finally, on an issue that Republicans seem set on trying to turn into a major national topic for debate, the question of acceptance of transgender Americans. 76% of Democrats say we don't go far enough in ending discrimination against trans individuals. Republicans couldn't disagree more. 79% say we've gone too far in accepting transgender people. As you could say, we are so opposite on all these views that we're almost repelling each other. It seems like we're going in opposite directions. As I said, Republicans are hoping to turn this transgender issue into a cultural wedge issue like they did on same-sex marriage in the 2004 campaign cycle. But when you look at all voters, there is only a slight plurality that say society has gone too far in accepting transgender people, which does not give the Republicans that reliable political advantage that you could see pushes this issue into the suburbs and would somehow peel off voters there. For comparison, an issue like abortion, that's closer to a two to one in favor of making abortion mostly legal. And we saw how that played out at the polls in 2022 to the Democrats' advantage. That's the definition of a wedge issue when there's sort of two to one, if you will. Republicans don't really have an audience with groups they've been struggling with politically either. Women, young voters, and college-educated voters all come down in favor of increasing rights for trans individuals. So if this were a successful wedge issue, there would have to be ways to peel off those types of voters. Here's the big takeaway, though. The culture wars aren't going away anytime soon, not with how far apart the two parties are in so many of these cultural and racial and ethnic questions. But it's unclear how much of an advantage Republicans are going to have in pushing these issues and legislating on them with restrictive laws and bans, especially when you have abortion sitting out there as sort of the king of all wedge issues. And for their part, Democrats appear to see an opening politically. President Biden's re-election campaign today released its first ad of the 2024 cycle. He's contrasting the Republican Party's position on using the government to restrict abortion and regulate other issues by focusing on the word freedom co-opting a notion that Republicans have brandished for years. Take a listen. Joe Biden has made defending our basic freedoms the cause of his presidency. The freedom for women to make their own health care decisions. The freedom for our children to be safe from gun violence. The freedom to vote and have your vote counted. For seniors to live with dignity. And to give every American the freedom that comes with a fair shot at building a good life. Joining me now from outside the White House with more on President Biden's campaign strategy is CNBC senior White House correspondent Kayla Tausche. And Kayla, we heard from the president today for the first time in sort of a, uh, a 
somewhat unscripted setting, if you will, at the, uh, the press conference with the South Korean president, where he addressed some of the uh, criticism uh, that's been coming in the polls of his potential candidacy. What can you report? Well, he said that he might not be the only candidate that would be able to beat Trump from the Democratic Party and that he would likely still be running even if former President Trump were not the likely GOP nominee, Chuck. But, you know, when he was asked about his age, that was sort of the elephant in the room. He was asked specifically about the large share of voters, specifically Democrats, who feel like he's too old to be running for re-election. And when he answered, he essentially said he feels young at heart. Here's the president. With regard to age, uh, I can't even say, I guess how old I am, I can't even say the number. It doesn't, it doesn't register with me. And, uh, but the only thing I can say is that um, one of the things that people are going to find out, they're going to see a race, and they're going to judge whether or not I have it or don't have it. I respect them taking a hard look at it. I take a hard look at it as well. I took a hard look at it before I decided to run. The president, of course, is 80. He would be 86 by the end of his second term. He would be the oldest incumbent to run for re-election, Chuck. Um, and as for those low favorability numbers, he says there's really no candidate that has high favorability numbers. So they're all in the trenches together. And you'll just see how the race shakes out. When it comes to get the specifics, how does the White House or the campaign, or I guess it's fused into one, explain their freedom ad? Well, I think they feel like the Republican Party is misaligned on the issues that matter most to the American electorate. And they point to the 2022 midterms as proof positive that the country generally wants access to abortion, that they generally want um, you know, certain gun control measures, that those are galvanizing issues for the American voter, and that if they can seize on those issues and they can get turnout, they can get enthusiasm, and they can ultimately swing some of these votes in their favor. I mean, you showed the numbers from the NBC News poll that nearly six in 10 respondents do believe that in most, if not all cases, abortion should be legal. And the White House feels like that's a statistic that is working in its favor. So expect to see that figure very prominently in their campaign. Kayla Tausche at the White House for us in CNBC. Kayla, thank you. Got a supersized panel today to break down our latest NBC News polling. Joining me on set, Benji Sarlin, Washington Bureau Chief for Semaphore. Tia Mitchell, the Washington correspondent for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Kimberly atkins Store, columnist for the Boston Globe and an NBC News contributor. And Jim Garrity, National Review senior political correspondent and a Washington Post contributing columnist. Let me put, uh, Kimberly, I want to put up this one graphic because it's a trend line that I think is important on this idea um, on our people judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. The line's crossed again. You know, when Obama got elected president, uh, a majority of this country believed, no, we must be the, con maybe MLK was right. The dream has been realized. Um, it's not lost on me that he leaves office and the lines are crossed again. It feels like that's the message of this whole poll. We are, we are sort of treading water right now culturally. Yeah, and an important point if you in that graphic is the last time that question was asked was before the Trump administration mm -hmm. and a new era where uh, cultural wars have become the political norm and, and race has been a central part of that. So clearly that has taken hold, that message has been heard, uh, and we are seeing the impact of that. I think it's also in part a realization that, yes, after Obama's election, there are a lot of Americans, particularly white Americans, who thought, hey, we're in a post-racial mm -hmm. world. And there was a rude awakening that was really crystallized by a lot of things, not just the murder of George Floyd, but a lot of other things that we've seen in equities that have come to bear. So I think all of those things converge to, to give us those numbers that we saw. Jim, let me show you another one with a trend line. The, ne the next poll I want to bring up is 60% of Americans think we are uh, a racist country yeah. uh, and that actually is up now we had we didn't we haven't asked this question enough but it is interesting to me that it's in 1988 a majority thought we were a racist nation and actually that number has gone up not down yeah um it's been a rough couple of years for the country mm -hmm. not just george floyd you can think back to the entire trump presidency charlottesville um you can go think about uh the, the covid experience and the disparity of people's ex uh, experiences through that um, and then just earlier this year, Donald Trump's having lunch with uh, Nick Fuentes, a white nationalist, and having really very little consequences. It seems, seems ma more mainstream. It seems like that that world it, got it, yeah. into the mainstream of the uh, GOP. That it's not as, as shocking. And I think people look at that 
And I, I, in, this, in this poll, I see a lot of weariness. I see people who are exhausted. This has nice not been an easy, uh, just tired of this. And want, wait, we're waiting for a return to normalcy, and we're not there yet by a long stretch. And Tia, the, the other number where I just see stagnation, and it gets to this weariness question, is this idea of which is more important, traditional values or encouraging tolerance? And we haven't budged in 10 years. We've been in the, I, we all expected our pollsters, the Democratic and the Republican pollster, when we were writing this question, they said, oh, I'm sure the lines are going to cross. That this is the first time mm -hmm. tolerance is going to overtake traditional values. Nope. Well, I think we've had a lot of conversation, our panel, before we came on. I and we, could hear. <laughs> it was very robust. We talked about the duality because, in general, I think when you ask most Americans, they want both. And different people have different understandings of what traditional values truly entails, number one. But... I think most people believe that they can have a sense of tradition but still want to tolerate others, tolerate folks who may not look like them. But the results by party tell me people do hear the political word. Right. Well, I think that. that's, but I think that's the duality is mm -hmm. what makes the poll kind of, there is no difference much because I think people still understand that both are at play in society. Again, this, especially with the culture wars, mm -hmm. this, this framework of, you know, wanting to understand tradition, go back to tradition, embrace tradition, but still with the culture wars, understand that there is a lot of intolerance in America. So those are just kind of little, I think those two ideals are constantly at battle with each other, and that's what the polls continue to kind of highlight. Tenji, I want to put up, we, we actually break this question down by race, and I think it's interesting because it, there isn't a ton of difference. Uh, when you look at it, uh, traditional values among white voters, 51-40 over tolerance, black voters, 48-47, Hispanic voters, 51-44. Look, all three groups have a religious core to them that, that I think hears the word traditional values and thinks religion first. But I think it gets to something there, too, which is on almost every major polling question, you see a massive split whenever you break it out in ethnicity. It's, it, it's incredibly unusual, actually, to see a poll like this where everyone's numbers are pretty much the same. I think it might speak to but the when you see the party, election. that's where you see the divide. It is mm -hmm. interesting to me when you take out politics. Exactly. When you just it. think of it that way. Yes. It's like I think when it's not trained on a specific issue, people feel like they can sort of break either way. They often feel torn, I feel. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I'm not sure either one of these fully expresses me. Um, it, and I think you, we see that in, in this poll, especially once you get into issues where there's a much higher partisan valence in some way, mm -hmm. you start seeing much more dramatic splits in the crosstabs, I think. Let's talk about the. Uh, so we asked folks to just define woke. Um, and, you know, here's a couple of summaries because I, I, we didn't want to throw it on there. We wanted to hear what people said to us. Their definition was those that describe themselves as Democrats d defined woke as. Here's a, one example. Filled with empathy and trying to understand other people, another person, mindful of historical inequities. The Republican responses included an excuse to run rampant and do what you please under a false pretense that you are a righteous, you are for a righteous cause. Another was a bunch of BS. There were some left-leaning voters who viewed it, that were older, who viewed it as overly politically correct with some of those responses, too. But for the most part, it's interesting to me that each side had a completely different definition of what it meant. And that's a good measurement of how uh, political messaging, how effective political messaging has been. Of course, that is a term that originated in the black community. Mm -hmm. That meant stay aware that no matter where you are in life, that that racial discrimination still exists, systemic discrimination still mm -hmm. exists, and don't forget that. But that has been taken over, weaponized, co-opted by conservatives who have tried to paint that as something, I should say by Republicans, who have paint that uh, as something negative, something scary, something to be mm -hmm. feared, something to push back against. And the results of that show just how well that has taken hold. What do you make of it? Well, I assume that when you say a bunch of BS, that there probably were other words that you just didn't want to use in the example. Uh, <laughs> they probably aren't appropriate for, for television or for the Internet. Well, we, maybe the Internet. Okay. The Internet, I was just yeah. going to say there are no um, look, I, you know, look, we've seen this in Trump's rhetoric. We've seen this in Ron DeSantis' rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see these guys talking that much about economics. You don't see these guys talking that much about foreign policy, the war in Ukraine, stuff like that. Culture war issues are what is galvanizing and exciting and gets people to sit up and pay attention. Um, but I don't see how it works with a swing voter. That was the thing no, that oh, came you know. through in here. I don't see how this is an effective way. I, I feel like that's going to be the big test for a lot of these campaigns. And it's something I've already heard expressed by strategists in both parties. One of the big questions about Ron DeSantis, just to name one example, but really all of them, is is the woke conversation really just concentrated to partisans who spend right. all day on Twitter or all day on websites that are designed just to stoke culture wars around this? If you talk to someone who's less engaged, do they have any idea what you're talking about? 
And I do think it's interesting that you did poll awareness, I believe, on the term, right? We did, and it was the awareness was greater than I thought to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think that where the woke kind of issue breaks down is the minute you push back and say, define it. What's too woke? What is woke about wanting to treat people with respect? Mm -hmm. And what is woke about tolerance? Then that people, you know, um, well, that's all okay. Well, then what are we talking about? And that's where, to your point, the Ron DeSantis's of the world, the Donald Trump's of the world, will probably have a difficult time um, spreading this uh, message of over-wokeness to swing voters or a general election audience because they often struggle to back up what they mean and find real-world examples. Mm -hmm. Let me move to transgender issues because this is another place where I feel like, again, the country certainly leans in a direction that is still trying to learn to accept trans individuals, but I don't think it's a wedge. Um, let me put up the numbers. 48% believe we've gone too far. Uh, 43% we haven't gone far enough. Huge differences uh, among uh, the parties there. There's a huge age gap, Kimberly. That's probably not surprising. 18 to 34, 54% believe they don't go far enough. Everybody over 35 believes we've gone too far Yeah. Uh, on that front. But here's the most important number in here. is if you know somebody who's trans, you suddenly think uh, 60, 67% believe they don't go far enough. The reason I point this out is this acceptance of trans folks number is actually in a, in, a, in a better position for trans folks today than same-sex marriage was in 2004. Right. We see things changing. And I think the age issue is important to put out there because I think, like the other, like other issues, it can be generational. And you know a lot of young people, even in elementary school, middle school, know people who are trans, and so it is not scary for them. But older people, again, there's political messaging that is coming from the Republican side mm-hmm. that is seeking to make that otherism scary, make it seem that they are a threat in some way and passing laws to stop that. And that's taking hold, too. I think you're probably seeing a greater divide happening there in real time. But over time, the younger people and the acceptance of that is coming up. But in the meantime, the political messaging for the Republicans is too strong to let go. 2004, Jim, uh, support for same-sex marriage was 3565. Mm-hmm. It is now literally polar opposite 6535. But back then, if you knew somebody who was gay, mm-hmm. you lit, worked somebody who was gay, your support for gay marriage, it was a net positive. Yeah. That's what this number, that's why it looks so familiar to us. Yeah, and my guess is you're going to see that number gradually increase as mm-hmm. more people feel comfortable expressing themselves that way. Um, it was only about, like, about a little more than a quarter, right? 28% people said they knew Correct. someone personally. Yeah. I think if your perception of the country as a whole is shaped by, for lack of a better term, the Acela Corridor mm-hmm. or Los Angeles, the, the big cities, right? the, the Coastal, cosmopolitan, the right? you're probably, yeah. oh my goodness, I know 14 people who are trans and you see these people. My guess is in Dubuque or wherever part of the, the rest of the country right. you want to describe, it's probably more rare. And that's probably why you're more, the reaction is much less likely to be positive than to folks who know them personally. Do you expect to see this in the general election? Absolutely. You I don't do. think people realize just this is maybe the dominant co- issue in the Republican primary being discussed right now in many ways. I buy that it's being the dominant issue now, but do we think it's going to be in a general? I think there's just going to be demand from the base. Now, Tr- do you remember when Trump was indicted? That was what, like three weeks ago? <laughs> how, how quickly was that conversation over? Like, like two days, right? Yeah. This Bud Light boycott, where yeah. Republicans have been, you know, uh, candidate after candidate speaking out against Bud Light just for doing a partnership yeah. on a transgender influencer's, you know, Instagram page, has been going on the entire time since, getting way more heat. And I don't think people quite realize the nature of this conversation right now. Yeah. The, the conversation on the Republican side right now has shifted from policies to, should these people basically yeah. be accepted in society at all? T, I don't mean to... Mm-hmm. Shrink here. Yeah, I give you. He took a little extra time of yours, but quickly. Well, I would just say in a general election, I think again that pushback is going to really require whatever Republican is on the ballot mm-hmm. to explain what he or she means when they push, if they try to push a yeah. narrative that transgender people are dangerous to society. All right. This was a terrific discussion. We had to get through a lot, but I think this is a quite a meaty cultural poll. Thank you. Really smart conversation. Coming up, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy tries to get the White House to negotiate over raising the debt limit. But he still has to get Republicans to vote for his plan first. We'll have the latest on the vote count from Capitol Hill next. Plus, the fight over transgender rights reaches a fever pitch in Montana, where House Republicans in that state have just voted to ban State Representative Zoe Zephyr from setting foot in the House chamber. Zoe Zephyr, the first openly transgender woman elected to the state's legislature, will join me later in the show. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. The House of Representatives is holding a debate right now on Speaker Kevin McCarthy's messaging bill on the debt limit, with a vote expected in less than an hour as House Republicans are attempting to ramp up some pressure on President Biden to simply come to the negotiating table over raising the country's borrowing limit. And Speaker McCarthy is hoping that if he can get this bill passed, it makes it harder for him to say no to talking. Right now, they don't want to give the president the votes to raise the debt limit without an agreement to cut some spending. The White House is calling the move an irresponsible act of economic hostage-taking. Even with McCarthy, uh, even if he gets his votes, though, the White House has already said that President Biden would veto it if it lands on his desk. It won't, though, because Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says McCarthy's plan is going nowhere in the Senate. And he's accusing House Republicans of wasting their time. It is DOA, plain and simple. And if Republicans refuse to level with the public about the terrible things their default act on America will do to them, Democrats will do the work ourselves. We'll let America know how bad this is, because Republicans are intent on hiding it. Ryan Nobles joins me now from Capitol Hill. Ryan, I get that the House Republican plan is dead on arrival in the Senate, but the President and Schumer's plan is dead on arrival in the House. So explain how this is going to work. Yeah, well, first off, Chuck, we should say that uh, Kevin McCarthy must feel pretty confident that he's got the votes here uh, in the next hour or so because he's scheduled a press conference uh, for 545 Eastern time uh, on this uh, debt limit bill. So it seems as though he's been able to marshal the Republicans he needs to get this over the finish line. But you're exactly right, Chuck. Uh, it takes three to tango when it comes to passing bills in Washington. You need the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And at some point, Democrats are going to have to sit down and have a conversation uh, with Kevin and McCarthy about what it's going to take uh, for both sides to come to an agreement on lifting the debt ceiling. Now, uh, Mitch McConnell today uh, put it out in pretty plain terms during his press conference. He said very specifically that Biden and McCarthy just need to get into a room and hash this out. You know, Chuck, I think it's very important to point out while uh, Chuck Schumer and many of these Democrats are kind of attacking the provisions in this bill and they're well within their rights to do so, there's literally no one that believes that this particular package is actually going to become law. This was a demonstration that Republicans could get their house in order uh, to mm -hmm. build a piece of leverage for these conversations to begin. So this is a starting point. It's by no yeah. means an ending point. The question is, how does Joe Biden respond? Should Kevin McCarthy see this as a vote of confidence, that he still has the trust of his, comp of his caucus? Well, if it had gone the other way, we'd certainly be asking questions right. about whether or not his speakership uh, could last even over the next couple of months. So I do think, Chuck, this was a big test of whether or not he can hold together this shaky coalition. And for a couple of days, it looked like he might not be able to. So the fact that he was able to marshal all these dispirited factions and bring them together uh, to get this bill over the finish line is, is a good sign for McCarthy as his speakership moves forward. Now, we should point out, like I said before, no one thinks this bill is going to become law. That makes it's a lot easier to, to cast a yes vote, uh, you know, when the rubber actually hits the road here and they've got to well, vote on something that will become law. Right. That's where the true test will be for Kevin. Well, McCarthy. you just told my first question to my next guest, Ryan Nobles <laughs> on Capitol Hill for us. Ryan, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if the congresswoman was listening there, she gets a hint at what my first question is going to be. Uh, Republican Congresswoman Victoria Sparts of Indiana joins me now. And, and Congresswoman, I want to start there. I know earlier today you were on the fence about this bill, but is it easier to vote for this knowing it's not the final bill? Well, listen, I think all votes are important, and I think, unfortunately, I hope that it's more than just a messaging bill. Hopefully, we'll have a serious adult conversation on really what's happening in this fiscal situation in our country and not fund the situation to our great-great-children and not cater to large special interest groups. And I was hoping to see more bipartisan issues that were supporting from both sides in this bill that we can maybe get President Biden on board and push, put pressure on the Senate that doing nothing and not governing this country because American people are sick and tired. They want to have some governing and not messaging, and we're really in real need of it. So it sounds like you think they, that some of the cuts in here, that they, they should have thought about cuts that they could get more Democratic support for? Well, I think it should be included and put them on the table, and I would like to see them in formal conversation. I think mm -hmm. Kevin maybe bring up them in, you know, in private conversation, but I think it's important because we need to show the American people that we able to come together. We did it after World War I. We did it after World War II. And actually, it, it's important for the country. We can debate and issues vigorously. But there are some issues when we have to come together for the good of this country and show that we can govern and then do politicking. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, unfortunately, this institution is lacking it, and I'm hoping that the final version is actually would include some of right. these issues. There are issues that Biden and Trump, Obama and Trump supported, and we could put them on the table. Do you, are you comfortable using the debt ceiling as leverage, or should this be done through the budget process? Well, listen, unfortunately, I'm a realist, and I understand that in Congress, only must pass bills have any traction that you can even push on the Senate. Otherwise, we just do a lot of talking and messaging, and nothing happens. It's unfortunately, we have very few items that must pass, and uh, unfortunately, only bad things add to these items, and we need to start adding items that are good for with the people, because there is no lobby for the people in Washington, D.C., and we need to grow a backbone to challenge yeah. fraud, abuse, and large special interest groups. What is your pressure point, though? All right, you know, there's a concern about default. Do you accept that economic calamity concern regarding the debt limit? No, I think we will need to pay our bills, but we also need to put responsibility in how we can at least find common ground on issues that actually American people are with us. We have 70-80% issues. For example, to save Medicare for seniors, we have fraudulent overbilling over of Medicare by large hospital monopolies that Trump supported to fix and, and, and Obama supported to fix. Mm -hmm. Bipartisan think tank just wrote a lot in support. We have Families USA, Brookings, Americans for Prosperity, Heritage, and American Enterprise Institute supporting that. This is an issue that billions of dollars of fraud and abuse to say it so why isn't that in seniors. Here? You know, and that's why I would like to see that because, unfortunately, I think everything got so politicized mm. that, you know, everyone is afraid to have a serious conversation. And unfortunately, Senate and New York legislators are pretty close with large monopolies, and we need to push on them. And I hope the Biden administration will have some common sense and do some things, at least bare minimum, what Obama was willing to do. So it's interesting because this, it sounds like you said the word special interest groups, and it made me think, uh, how do you feel about the ethanol subsidies in here? Should they have been included or not included? Well, listen, I'll be honest with you. We subsidize in too many large corporations in all of the industries. And if you're the little guy, you're not going to get all of these abatements and tax credits and every access to all of this government money. And small businesses get in crash. That's why we have oligopoly, monopoly problem in every business sector. Unfortunately, laws and a lot of this credit is written in the way that people closer to the government take advantage of them. So I think we need to clean up our code from all of the loopholes. And there are some loopholes we can at least agree on a bipartisan basis because competition will bring prosperity to the little guy in small businesses yeah. that is the core and we are not discussing this issue because unfortunately they're politically charged and there's too much money in Washington DC that control and especially the Senate I'll be honest with you Senate is such a broken institution right yeah. now not doing the job well I think a, 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 the legislative branch in general does feel that way sometimes let me ask you this it sounds to me as if uh, well, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Would you accept the debt ceiling hike if there was an agreement for a bipartisan committee like we saw the last time? Is that good enough, or do you need to see real cuts with any debt ceiling agreement? Well, I think, you know, we need to look at some real savings and cuts we actually can do for programs, at least to eliminate fraud and abuse. But then I think we need to have a serious conversation. But not just that, like we do all these commissions with, you know, with never ending paperwork and everything else. We did something when we were serious after World War I. We created a bipartisan committee where we say we're going to solve this problem and we're on a bipartisan basis come together and we're not going to ruin our country and future of our grandchildren. It's a responsible because most of this money, as you know, don't go to we the people, you know. And I think, I hope we have that discussion, but there are some also easy issues that we can find common ground and start moving the needle because, you know, Congress only has an ability, 10-year plans never work in Congress. I have no ability to tell what people will be doing in 10 right. years. Let's just move the needle in a productive way now to show the people that we're a serious institution and we're willing to govern and come together even in challenging time. I think American people need it. Do you, uh, do you feel an extra sense of freedom that you're not running for re-election? No, I don't listen. I always, it doesn't matter for me. I always say what is the right thing to do and what is the right you know, thing for the people. I've mm -hmm. always been very uh, open-minded and willing to tell the truth. And I think I hope more politicians are willing to tell the truth. American people are not stupid. American people will be with us. We need to communicate better. And American people will support if we want to do real good things for the country. And, uh, you know, and I've been doing town halls yeah. <laughs> last Congress and this Congress and tell people the truth. And I think Washington
Washington, D.C. could use a little bit more truce. Congresswoman Victoria Sparks, uh, Republican from Indiana, I always appreciate having you on uh, and the perspective that you bring to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, I'm going to talk to a White House senior advisor about the view from the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue amid this looming debt ceiling deadline. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we mentioned, Speaker Kevin McCarthy is preparing to bring his debt limit bill to the House floor for a vote. That vote could come in just the next few minutes. We'll be keeping our eye on it. It comes as President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy remain locked in a standoff as, some, as the summer. We don't know if it's going to be early June or mid-August when we hit the debt ceiling, but the deadline is approaching. And joining me now is Mitch Landry. He's the White House Infrastructure Coordinator, Senior Advisor to President Biden, and somebody that's out here today to talk a little bit about what's going on between the White House and Congress in regards to the debt ceiling. Mitch Landrieu, I appreciate you coming out here. Sure, Chuck. Uh, let me start with, we expect at some point today the House Republicans are going to have their proposal, what they would like to see in exchange for a raise in the debt ceiling. Let me put up uh, a little bit of the, of the ideas they have in there. Cap budget growth of 1% per year. Claw back on spent COVID money, strip some funding for uh, the IRS, and add some work requirements for certain things like Medicaid. Um, I know there's some of these things are non-starters, but is the budget growth and unspent COVID money non-starters? Well, listen, again, th this is about trying to hold the economy hostage in exchange for raising the debt limit. That's what the non-starter is. The president is now, has always been willing to negotiate about budget and spending and putting his priorities, which grow the economy, put people back to work, create manufacturing jobs, lower people's cost, provide child care, make sure that we take care of the opioid crisis up against what it is uh, the Speaker and the MAGA Republicans in the House want to talk about, which essentially is going to raise the deficit over time and actually cut 22 percent from the budget. That's a discussion and a negotiation that the president and Congress can have either face to face or you know, right. over, over the course of how you negotiate with Congress, what is not uh, really on the table is trying to take the economy into default by using the debt limits mm -hmm. to hold the economy uh, uh, hostage. I understand that, that point of view. At the end of the day, it is up to Congress to raise this debt limit, and there's nothing in here. And look, Democrats have put provisions on the debt limit when a Republican was in the White House, and Republicans like to put provisions on the debt limit when a Democrat's in the White House. Whether we think that's responsible or not, that's obviously subjective, but it's the political reality. At this point, doesn't the president well, have to sit down with McCarthy and, at least, and, and figure out how they're going to raise this debt limit? But, but Chuck, again, the, the premise is that, that you just stated is a little bit wrong. Under Ronald Reagan uh, and under Donald Trump, the debt limit was raised without really a lot of noise and a lot of discussion, without holding the economy hostage. Uh, and it's happened many, many, many times. So it's not as though it's, it's, a, it's a us versus them on that particular issue. I think every responsible economist uh, in the country and in the world says that teetering on the edge, walking on a knife's edge, that could create the economy is a bad thing. And especially uh, when we're having a manufacturing boom. You mm -hmm. know, the president's created 12.1 million jobs, 850,000 manufacturing jobs. This discussion is actually uh, pushing forward. And I think there was an independent yeah. analysis that came up that said it's actually pushing us closer to possibly a recession. That is not a good idea. At the end of the day, though, the president and Congress always sit down and talk about budget right. issues. If, it's, if it is the House Republicans' wish uh, to give wealthy billionaires a tax break at the expense of providing food to kids in school or dealing with opioid addiction, we can have that discussion any time that they want. But again, I think the issue here is deal with the debt limit, get that out of the way, and then if you guys want and gals want to mm -hmm. have a talk about how the country is going to go forward and whether right. your vision of America is better than the president's, you know, any day, any time. Look, I get, you know, but, you know, you get to a point where this becomes a game of chicken and somebody's got to swerve, and are you confident they're willing to swerve? Well, let me say this. What I'm confident is the president is going to protect the full faith and credit of the United States of America today, tomorrow, and at any time. That is what his job is, and to protect America's position in the world economy and making sure that we actually put people to work. That's the most critical part of this. On the other side of this, the president always says, just watch what it is that we do. And the president has brought a lot of receipts. And so you know these numbers, Chuck, that they're, they're real. 12.1 million jobs OK, the lowest unemployment rate, yeah. 800,000 manufacturing jobs and reducing the deficit by three trillion dollars. That's a good plan. 
and America ought to stay on that track. And that's what the president is trying to do, and he's going to demonstrate his leadership by continuing to do exactly that. Uh, obviously, this, uh, in hindsight, is just that. It's, it's hindsight, and there's not much you can do about it. But Democrats could have raised the debt ceiling in the lame duck and didn't. Uh, is that yeah. turning out to be a mis mistake? I don't know. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. You know, looking back is always a hard thing. I think I you have to that. deal with the hand that's dealt with you. But again, the president's continuing to really do the work. And the idea is to grow the economy, which is what we're doing with infrastructure. When you invest in American roads, bridges, airports, ports, mm -hmm. waterways, we have 25,000 projects going on. We have huge manufacturing jobs, you know, that are coming to working class folks in this country, many of which don't require college education. That is a good message to the American people. So again, raise the debt limit. Let's get that out of the way. And then if you want to have a talk about your vision for the future and the president's vision, where he's investing from the bottom up and the middle out, we'd love to have that discussion every day. I understand that the, that the official position is we don't negotiate over the debt limit. But what? At so, there's no choice in the matter at this point, since you need House Republicans to pass it. Well, I think there's a lot of water still to go under the bridge. This bill, it should, should it pass today, has got to go over to the Senate. The Senate then has got to do its work. You know, this is a give-and-take situation that we're in. But the president has been very, very clear. His job is to defend mm -hmm. America, to defend the economy in the America, and holding the debt limit hostage with the threat of tanking the economy is not, is not a thoughtful or reasonable thing to yeah. do. If you want to talk about the 22 percent cuts that the MAGA Republicans want to push on the American people, where we're cutting health care, cutting opioids, cutting public safety, cutting rail safety, cutting veterans affair at the expense of giving the wealthy a tax break, we, we can have that discussion at the appropriate time. I know your job is to help implement and coordinate the infrastructure bill, not the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. But you do know Joe Manchin well, because he was an integral part of getting the infrastructure deal done, and I'm sure you deal with him a lot. I do. Uh, he is ready to support the repeal of a bill that he essentially helped write. Um, how's the White House lost Joe Manchin? Say, ask that question one more time. I'm sorry. He's supporting a repeal. He's, he yeah. may support the repeal of a bill he wrote. And he's obviously very upset at the White House. He's very upset at the president. Thinks that, that, that the Inflation Reduction Act isn't being implemented fairly. It looks to me as if the White House has sort of lost Joe Manchin. You, well, I don't, how I don't, did that listen, happen? First of, first of all, I don't think that's accurate. Joe Manchin is a, is a friend. I know him. He, he and the president... Uh, our friends and have been for a long time and have worked well together on many, many things. And he continues to be a key ally. He's got a particular view about this. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, as you know, right now is one of the things that's helping create a manufacturing boom and bringing in a green energy economy that's going to be critical to the future of the country. There's a difference of opinion at the moment. Those conversations take place behind closed doors and they take place out in public. And my expectation is they will continue to do so. We've seen many, many instances over the last two years where Senator Manchin, you know, has gotten has gotten irritated with the president and vice versa. But at the end of the day, it's about sitting down and talking and they're going to continue to do that until we get to a good place. You don't uh, this has nothing to do with uh, Joe Manchin's threat to run as a third party for president. I, don't, I saw him on TV a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked him that, and he said, listen, his mission is to try to help unite people. The president's mission is the same. Remember, at the end of the day, my guess is that, that Senator Manchin and Joe Biden think a lot more alike uh, than the differences that, that separate him on these issues that he's passionate about. But where there's a difference of opinion, they will handle it respectfully. They've been knowing each other for a very, very long time. The president's position is that the IRA was a really great piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. It continues to produce manufacturing jobs and put us in a position of having a clean energy economy that's producing high paying jobs, many of which uh, can be occupied with people that don't have a college education and it makes a lot of sense. And that's where the president is today. Uh, and I think we'll continue to be there. All right, Mitch Landrieu, who, as I said earlier, Chuck. is the White House uh, a coordinator uh, in implementing the infrastructure bill. Good to see you. Thanks for coming on and sharing Thanks, the uh, Chuck. White House perspective. Thank you, sir. Good being with you. you got All it, right. Buddy. Coming up after the break, the Republican presidential field just got crowded by one more candidate. And the fight between DeSantis and Disney just got officially more contentious. You're watching Meet the Press now. I've been a consistent conservative through my time as leader of the party in the United States Congress and as governor. And now I bring that same vigor to a fight in another battle, and that battle is for the future of our country and the soul of our party. Today, I am announcing that I am a candidate for President of the United States. 
Welcome back. That was former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson officially kicking off his presidential bid today with a speech in his hometown of Bentonville, Arkansas. He leveled a series of criticism against President Biden. Hutchinson hit the administration on everything from the economy, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, while also laying out his own policy plans. In recent months, Hutchinson has been one of the most vocal, really the only vocal critic on the right side of the aisle of Trump these days, more than any of the other declared presidential candidates. Though Hutchinson did not mention the former president by name today in the official remarks, Hutchinson is joining a growing list of Republicans that are now officially running for president. There is the potential list over there on the right and what is expected to be perhaps uh, a fairly uh, robust field, though not nearly as crowded as it was in 2016. And it's not quite a Cinderella story, but there are new developments out of Florida today in the escalating fight between Disney and Governor Ron DeSantis. The company officially filed a lawsuit in federal court today, accusing the governor and other officials in the state of Florida of a, quote, targeted campaign of government retaliation in response to Disney's just rhetorical opposition to Florida's recent anti-LGBTQ laws. The suit is the latest salvo by Disney as it fights with DeSantis over control of the area that uh, encompasses Walt Disney World. The announcement of the suit came just minutes after a DeSantis-appointed board voted to void an agreement that would let Disney keep primary control of the area that uh, envelops the entire Disney World empire there. The fight between the company and DeSantis began when Disney CEO Bob Iger publicly crit uh, criticized the Florida law. It wasn't Bob Iger, excuse me, when the previous uh, before predecessor to Bob Iger publicly criticized the Florida law that keeps teachers from talking about the LGBTQ community. Since Iger's taken over, Disney has gotten even more aggressive. And still to come, Democratic Montana lawmaker Zoe Zephyr will respond right here to the actions of her Republican colleagues moments ago. The Montana House banned her from setting foot on the House floor following a dispute over transgender rights and what comments she made in defense of the issue. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Here was the scene in the Montana State House just moments ago as the Republican-controlled State House voted to punish transgender State Representative Zoe Zephyr over comments she made about a bill that would deny gender-affirming care to minors. Zephyr, who is the state's first and only transgender lawmaker, told colleagues last week she hoped when they bowed their heads in prayer, they would, quote, see blood on your hands. Republican leaders in the state legislature responded by demanding she apologize for her comments while denying Zephyr the chance to speak during debate this week. And they also attacked her by misgendering her. In response, some protesters rallied in support of Zephyr. And during the proceedings today, she was allowed to speak right before the House passed a measure to ban her from setting foot on the House floor for the rest of this session, but preserving her ability to vote remotely. Here's Representative uh, Zephyr speaking to her House colleagues last hour. When I rose up and said, there is blood on your hands, I was not being hyperbolic. I was speaking to the real consequences of the votes that we as legislators take in this body. And when the speaker asks me to apologize what he is, uh, on behalf of decorum, what he is really asking me to do is be silent when my community is facing bills that get us killed. He's asking me to be complicit in this legislature's eradication of our community. And I refuse to do so. And I will always refuse to do so. Montana State Representative Zoe Zephyr joins me now. Representative Zephyr, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Let me start with um, trying to get some clarification of why you were uh, denied the House. What, what the punishment is for, is it for what you said on the House floor last week, or is it for the protest that took place in support of your right to speak? So when the speaker denied me the ability to speak, in doing so, he silenced not only me, but the nearly 11,000 Montanans that I represent. And when he continued to deny me the ability to speak, many of those Montanans came to the House to demand that their representative, that an elected representative be given her voice on the floor. Mm -hmm. And they took issue with my support of the people coming and protesting in defense of democracy. Did the uh, speaker ever ask to meet with you privately? Did you ever have a one-on-one -on -one with the speaker or anything like that out of, uh, or any phone conversation, anything like that? 
there was a brief conversation where the speaker asked if I would apologize. And I said, as I said on the floor today, right. these bills have real impacts and I won't apologize for that. To which he said short, uh, later that evening, I will not, I will no longer recognize you on the House floor. And is it, is there a rule in the House? Does the Speaker have that kind of power or does he have that kind of power because of the supermajority? So, and that's where it gets to the real crux of the issue here is the unequal application of rules of decorum. There have been hearings and there have been moments on the floor where legislators have screamed in their closing, mm -hmm. where legislators have insinuated that my very existence as a queer person is somehow sexualizing children. Mm -hmm. And we object to that, just like the majority leader objected to my comments. And then we move on because we are elected to have the debates that our constituents elected us here to do so. Do you have any legal recourse? I'm uncertain of uh, next steps on that front. What I will say right now is that I am focused on my role as a legislator, being ready for bills, making sure that I have what I would want to say on that legislation, right. and that I am ready uh, to vote and work on behalf of the constituents who elected me. But are you allowed to do much work here? I mean, it feels as if they let you vote remotely, but you're not allowed to, are you allowed to participate in committee debates remotely? So this decision is a doubling down of the silencing of 11,000 Montanans. Um, they, every time a bill is up on the House floor for the remainder of the session, budget bills, housing bills, et cetera, there will be 11,000 Montanans right. whose voices aren't heard in that debate. That said, I will work behind the scenes with my colleagues to make sure that points that I want to make right. are made on the floor and uh, take votes, et cetera. That's why I asked about legal recourse. I think there's some constitutional... Uh, issues here, uh, equal protection, uh, all of those things that, uh, let alone, one would argue, your First Amendment rights. Um, ha have you spoken to a, 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 a lawyer about this or not? Uh, I'm beginning to look into things on, on, on that front, but there are constitutional protections, particularly saying that as legislators, we are granted the same, if not more, First Amendment rights to make sure that we're having the hard conversations right. that our constituents elected us to have. I'm curious, are any any of these uh, legislators that did vote to ban you, have any of them reached out privately with any regrets or any anything? Has there been any, did you, did you have any sort of working relationship with Republicans across the aisle? Uh, I've had working relationships with Republicans across the aisle on an array of issues. And there have been many that over the session expressed that they didn't really like that their party was attacking the trans community so much, but they worried about being primaried or their party leadership uh, put, um, squashing their bills. But ultimately, when it came to the votes for those bills, much like the votes today, they found themselves on the wrong side of democracy. What kind of response do you feel like you're receiving from Montanans outside the, the legislature? You know, there's such a Perception. I can tell you, my political perception of Montana is normally a very libertarian place, a little bit. That that's why people like living in Montana. That there's a little bit of live and let live, um, but that's not what this legislator's actions look like. Montana does have a live and let live mindset with a history of progressive uh, ideology. In that we elected the first woman to Congress. We're one of the birthplace of the union fights and fighting the Copper Kings. And so I've had a ton of messages from constituents, not just LGBTQ people and allies, but conservatives who are saying, I may disagree with you, but what the Republicans, what the far right is doing in this state is fundamentally opposed to the ideals of democracy in our country. Have you heard from any national Democrats? Have you heard from the White House? Uh, I spoke recently with the uh, lawmakers in Tennessee Mm. who were expelled for, again, standing up for the way legislation and policies get communities killed. And so I spoke with them about what it takes to stand up in these moments and how we fight for our country to yeah. make sure democracy exists here. You know, the governor of Utah, one of the reasons he vetoed one of these bills early on, he said it, it, it was concerned about the statistics that showed the higher suicide rates among uh, among trans teens, uh, particularly if if they're feel to if they're made to feel unaccepted, if you will. Have you had any conversations with moderate Republicans? Like you said, when you won, you said when you won, you said you were going to work and have some conversations and bring moderate Republicans into this fight. Have you had much success 
uh, setting aside today's vote? Yes. You know, I've had those conversations with moderate Republicans, both the statistics and, as I mentioned on the floor today, real stories of there was a family in Montana whose trans teenager attempted suicide while watching one of the anti-trans hearings. And so I've had those real conversations with moderate Republicans. The struggle right now is when you have a super majority of Republicans in Montana, uh, particularly far right Republicans, right. what happens is you need 19 votes. And if you only get seven or eight, these harmful bills still pass. State Representative Zoe Zephyr, a Democrat from Montana. Appreciate you coming on. I know this has been quite a week, uh, quite a month. Um, uh, but we'll be watching, uh, and you certainly have a place to speak out uh, in a lot of places. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.